One of my favorite events of the year is coming up, the annual Stansbury Research Conference. And folks, the conference is now officially sold out for in-person tickets. But I'm not surprised. This is one of the best industry events out there. Some of the brightest financial minds will be sharing their biggest ideas and actionable stock recommendations, covering oil, cryptos, big tech, precious metals, real estate, gold, and so much more. Well, I have really good news. You can still access all this valuable information. Go to McCallStansburyBoston.com right now and reserve a live stream ticket. You can watch all the brilliant presentations in the comfort of your own home. Just one successful idea shared on stage could pay for your ticket and then some. I'm going to finish the touches on my presentation right now. And trust me, you won't want to miss what I have to say. So please go to McCallStansburyBoston.com for all the details, including the amazing speaker lineup and how to get your live stream access. Again, that's McCallStansburyBoston.com. Folks, look for me on stage. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's October 11th, 2022. A beautiful Tuesday morning here in South Florida. It's not as beautiful for the markets right now. We had the NASDAQ break to a two-year low. Several other industries breaking down the lows as well. We're going to cover that. Also, we're going to take a look at income players. Are there places out there right now you could be going with your money and getting big, big yields and avoiding the big sell-offs? I got four stocks you need to consider. All that and more coming up right now on Making Money. Hello and welcome again. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 11th of October, 2022. It is a Tuesday morning here in South Florida. Thank you so much for joining me. We got a big show coming up. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of action going on uh, in the markets uh, this week and last week. I mean, let's take a look back last week really quick. You know, Monday and Tuesday were one of the biggest two-day rallies we've seen in years. And then that was followed by a major sell-off um, based on the jobs number on Friday. The markets were still up on the week, believe it or not. You wouldn't have felt that way. However, we started off this week uh, on a negative note again. And as I mentioned, the NASDAQ now breaking down to a two-year low. S&P and Dow are both very close to that, holding below the lows from prior this year, uh, but barely holding on at this point. Let me show you a chart right now of the S&P 500. And as you can see here, uh, we are down about almost 1%. This is the SPIs, the SPY, the ETF that tracks the S&P 500. However, if we close here, this will be a new two-year low for the S&P 500 as well. So we're seeing continued selling. And if I go over to the QQQs, which is a NASDAQ 100 index ETF, down 1.5%, again, near the lows of the session around 1030, around an hour into trading here on Tuesday morning. So the weakness does continue in the market this morning. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, one uh, is the fact that interest rates remain extremely high. Two, we have earnings season really kick off in earnest later this week. A lot of worries about that going forward. The fighting in Ukraine uh, continues to escalate in the last few days. That's not a good sign for anybody in the world right now. So the negativity that's been driving the market is still there. It's been in the headlines a little more uh, recently. And I, I can tell you, folks, it's, it's just one of those situations where I talk about this a lot, that the negativity, it's running rampant. It, it's, it's basically unprecedented. I go back to COVID. That was a one-off black swan. You know, as negative as, and scared as people were for a few weeks, a lot of us turned around and realized uh, that this isn't going to end the world. Uh, that things are going to be okay when we rebound from that. We have great medical research, and uh, we'll get past this, which we did. You go back to 08, 09, uh, the great financial crisis. You know, I was on TV then, Fox News all the time, Fox Business, and uh, it, it hurt. It was ugly, but it seemed like it was very much isolated to the financial sector. It didn't spread as much to Main Street. So we didn't have that going on as much. Go back a little bit to the 2007-ish, 2006, 2007, when the housing market started to top out and, and people started feeling that and foreclosures, et cetera. That hit Main Street. But again, it wasn't widespread because a lot of people that owned homes they should own or were making payments weren't directly affected by that. <clears throat> the value of their homes came down, but they weren't selling anyway. Go all the way back then, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, when we did tech sell-off, 
again, more isolated tech. It wasn't as widespread. So what I'm trying to say here is this is not just isolated to the stock market. The inflation aspect brings it to Main Street as well. And imagine a lot of people who came uh, to the mailbox this weekend and opened their statements for the third quarter for their 401ks, their IRAs, their investment accounts. They look at it and they realize, wow, it's down big. <clears throat> and, you know, a reason it's down so big is because bonds are down, stocks are down. I talk about that a lot. But let me show you a chart right here. I, I pulled from Charlie Biello. This shows the return going back to 1928. So back to the depression. So let's call it a century, not quite. It shows return of the S&P 500 each year, return of the U.S. 10-year treasury, and a return of the 60-40 portfolio. The 60-40 portfolio is 60% in the S&P 500, 40% in the U.S. treasuries. And as you can see, there's a lot of green on this screen, folks. There really is, especially for the 60-40. I mean, my goodness, you look back, to 2004, take out this year, only two down times we've been down. You go back here, 85, only three times. But look at this. This is year to date right here as of the end of the third quarter. So the end of September. And this has only gotten worse. The S&P down 24% of the time. The 10-year, if you're invested in that, because yields go up, bond prices come down. And the 10-year, if you're invested in that, down nearly 17%. And the 60-40 portfolio is sitting at a negative 21%. Let's go back through these 60-40s. The only other time that was worse than that right now to end the year was 1931. 37 closed, just about that. But who knows where we end in the next three months. Hopefully, it's much better than a negative 21. But again, my point I'm trying to get across is what we're seeing, and I've used this word a lot recently, unfortunately, is unprecedented. It truly is unprecedented right now what we are seeing. Let me show you another chart. This is the chart of the S&P 500 bear markets. This is going back again to the Great Depression, so nearly a century. As you can see in this chart, again from Charlie as well, it shows going all the way back to the September 29 to June 31 uh, bear market. It shows the length of the bear market in months. It shows the length of the uh, recession, if there was one, in months. And it shows the start and the end of the S&P 500. We can see here S&P down about 26% uh, so far uh, in the bear market we had that started earlier this year in January 2022. But what I want to look at is it's the, the, the mean with, with no recession, uh, the length of the uh, bear market with no recession, seven months. We're at eight right now. I don't care what the government says. We're likely in a recession to me. That mean is going to be 16%. For all of them, the mean pullback means the average pullback lasts about 12 months for all. If you have a recession, 16 months. We're eight months in. I'm not saying we have eight more months of a pullback here. Just giving you the numbers. More importantly, let's look at the pullback. The mean pullback of 26%, we're at that right now. That's with no recession. With the recession, 29, the median of all is 29%. So if we take the median uh, for all, we're looking at about 12 months, 29%. So that would put us, what, around the end of the year, a little bit lower from where we are now, if we kind of go with just all of them. And this, to me, won't be a, a major recession as far as GDP is concerned. Uh, as far as how people feel, I think it's pretty damn hard. Uh, I think it's hitting people. But again, just showing you at this point, and the reason I like to show these numbers is, if we take the mean of all the bear markets we've had in the last century, the mean pullback or median pullback, I should say, not the mean, median pullback, 29% or 26. A lot of stocks have pulled back 70%. And I say to myself, well, would I want to buy XYZ stock for down 70%? No, because I think we could have one more downdraft, as, as I've been saying. So maybe it pulls back 80%. But during that next pullback, say it gets down to 75% off its highs. And I think at some point in the next five years, it could hit a new all-time high. That means that this stock has to go up 4X to get back up there. So you have a 4X upside, 300% to the upside. It's 4X is 300% to the upside. 300% upside, but it's already down 75, and I think it could go down maybe go down a few more, 10% more. 300 to 10, that's a 30 to 1 reward to risk ratio. That's what we're starting to see right now. We're starting to see setups in the market itself and in individual stocks. I did a lot of reading last night as I was trying to read before I go to bed instead of watching the football game, which I had on the background on mute. But I tried to read to sleep a little better. 
When I was reading back history, looking back in the 80s, 90s, 70s, all these, these decades, as I was a child growing up, trying to get some view on that, how people felt then. It's the same damn feeling we feel now that stocks aren't going to go back up. Semiconductors down big again today. Semiconductors aren't over. Every piece of electronics in here, in a studio, has semiconductors, chips running it. The demand can, is going to continue. I don't care if we ban the export to China. I don't care if China does something else. That's all bullshit in the near term. Chip demand is only going up. Sure, you can say, well, it's a commodity now. It, yeah, it could be commoditized. You could consider that. It doesn't matter, though. The demand is going up, and there will be companies that make the next generation of chips that are going to be amazing. So please keep that in mind. And one more chart I want to show you. Because the negativity is so damn high right now. This is looking back since 1987. And this is the AAII, American Association of Individual Investors. I talk about this all the time. If you take the bulls minus the bears, when we have extreme fear, the bottom three, that's when that spreads negative 28 or worse. And greed, when it's above 40 or better. Look at the returns. We're down around negative 40 right now. Look at the returns. Three months, six, nine, one year, three or five year. And I always say I want five year because that's what I'm holding on for. 89.6%. Folks, I think that the return S&P from five years from now is going to be much more than that. Again, I, I'm not trying to be Pollyanna here or not look at the situation we're involved in. I do see it. Politics suck. Inflation sucks. Interest rates going up sucks. The stock market getting low sucks. It all hurts. Your portfolio going down hurts. But it's not the end of the world. Long-term investors always come out on top. It doesn't feel like it today but you come out on top. So speaking of investing, let's talk about, uh, as I mentioned, yield. You know, I've had a lot of people asking me lately, um, how do I get yield? Well, you know, you look at the 10-year yield right now. If you're looking at the 10-year, you want to buy into treasuries. I mean, it's pretty damn high right now. It's about 3.94%. Considering last September is about 1.3. So that's pretty damn high considering it's about 3x. Uh, so you can look at that. Uh, the the two years even above that, it's, it's four and change. It's about four and a quarter or so right now. That's one way of doing it. Uh, that being said, uh, there is a chance that maybe at some point the Fed pivots, those yields, uh, you know, come down. But you're locked in at that if you buy just, buy just a straight treasury. So I have no problem with that. Good tax implications. But if you want to look outside of treasuries and outside of bonds, um, maybe let's take a look at some equities, some stocks that pay some nice dividends. So I went through some big names. I went through stocks that are in uh, the S&P 500, some bigger names. And I came up with four diverse stocks that pay nice dividend yields. And I'll share those with you in a moment. Um, and to me, maybe some stocks you want to consider. Um, so let's take a look here at number one. Number one is Big Blue. And if you don't know who Big Blue is, I don't know what to tell you. IBM, International Business Machines. Symbol, obviously, is IBM. Company's been around forever, uh, was an innovator back in the day. Uh, it's still a, a cutting edge company at uh, a, market, a market value of $106 billion. Has a dividend yield right now 5.5%. So greater than the yield that is talked about in the treasuries. You know, it's in 175 countries, folks, and over 350,000 employees. I've had a lot of friends who work for IBM uh, out in Colorado, outside Boulder. They had a uh, big uh, headquarters out there, and they all loved it. 95% of the Fortune 500 companies are clients of Big Blue. Some of these numbers blew, blew me out of water when I saw these uh, doing research on this. They manage 90% of all credit card transactions globally. They're responsible for 50% of all wireless connections around the world. I mean, that is mind-blowing to me. And they continue to invest money. They just came out last week, uh, they're, I mean, like two weeks ago. They're going to invest about $20 billion in Hudson Valley, New York. We know that, just outside New York City. Uh, over the next decade, uh, to build some um, 
uh, headquarters there, uh, concentrating on semis, uh, chips, uh, cloud, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. They're obviously doing that because they're getting some help from the government. Uh, the government's pushing through the Chips and Service Act, which will give money uh, to companies that are building chips uh, in related sectors here in the United States. Um, look back at the chart. I could show you the chart here really quick. Uh, here's a chart of IBM. Uh, this is going back basically this year. You can see, you know, it's kind of had this uh, up and down nowhere uh, this year. However, it's done much better than the overall market. One thing, if I zoom out here, you can see this is going back uh, all the way to uh, late 2000. We're basically at the same level. I mean, obviously, we've had a lot of dividends along the way, but the stock price itself is at the same level. The stock peaked in 2013, around $215 a share. We're down to 118 now. If I go out even further, because obviously IBM has been around a long time, I go all the way back to the 60s. And split adjusted, IBM's down around $4.50. It went up to 210. It's pulled back quite a bit. So a lot of people say, well, maybe it's too late for this. And, and when I say too late, I, I'm not saying uh, Big Blue here is the next innovative co um, company that's going to lead things. Uh, I'm not saying it's dead either. Uh, but I'm, we're looking for stocks that kind of outside the realm of the more aggressive, uh, innovative, small cap, mid cap uh, that I discuss quite often. Big Blue could be one of them. The one thing I love about IBM um, is quantum computing. They are clearly a leader in quantum computing. And the, uh, one of the executives came out earlier this year, and they said that they believe that they'll have thousands of quantum computers for sale uh, in the next three years. And they believe they'll start going on sale in 2025, so it's three years from now. If you don't know what quantum computing is, it is it's truly it's, it, it's such fast computing power, processing power. It's amazing. So right now, we use a binary process. And to make that very simple, we use ones and zeros. Okay. This allows for different states between just ones and zeros. So make, making you know, the computer so much more powerful. So instead of just ones and zeros, you have multiple combinations, which then increases that multiplying, uh, multiplies that processing power exponentially. To give you an idea, most machines right now run on about 127 qubits. The quantum computers that IBM is talking about in three years will have 4,000 qubits of computing power. That's about a 31x increase from what we have now. The executive from IBM said this. He said a few months ago, to have that type of power right now, the machine would have to be the size of the earth. So the innovation we're going to be seeing in quantum computing is going to absolutely change the world. Directly, we will feel it. You think about using that with artificial intelligence for drug discovery. What we have right now with AI drug discovery is amazing. So much for, further ahead than we were five or 10 years ago. But you take the computing power up 31x and eventually more, you're able to run through all these potential compounds to fight diseases in a fraction of the time. And not even on humans because you have all the information in there. We will become up, be able to come up with new drugs and treatments in probably less than a year by the end of the decade versus 10 years with a success rate below 10%. Success rate will go through the roof because it's all being run on computers. It's, it's, it's going to change the world, folks. And that's just one example. So looking at the, at the numbers of uh, Big Blue IBM, revenue is only expected to increase annually about 3.5% in the next couple of years. So that's not jumping out at me. However, earnings are expected to increase annually by about almost 12%. That's really impressive for a company this size. Uh, four P ratios, about 11.7. Four price of sales, 1.7. So valuation is good. Again, a 5.5% dividend. So I look at IBM and I go back here real quick to look at this chart. It's down near a low. I'll zoom out a little bit to give you an idea of kind of where we're sitting right here. I mean, a lot of support in this area. And it's 116 to 118. So I got to tell you, the more I look at this, you know, I'm not going to say IBM is going to be a, a 2X or a 3X in the next three, five years, but this could be a nice portion of your portfolio that's less aggressive, still in tech, still inv investing in innovation, aka quantum computing, and getting a nice dividend along the way. So that is uh, number one here. I got four stocks for you. We're going to pivot over to a completely different sector that's actually been holding up, believe it or not, much better than the market. Um, and that's a stock in the biotech. 
sector, and that is uh, Gilead Sciences. The symbol is G-I-L-B. Uh, Gilead is a $80 billion company. Their core portfolio of treatments uh, is based around a lot of diseases that don't have treatments right now. However, the approved drugs that they have, uh, they really concentrate highly on HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. The company is known as one of the largest HIV drug companies in the world. Uh, through acquisitions over the last five years or so, uh, they also now have a focus on pulmonary disease as well as cancer oncology. And um, just last week, J.P. Morgan came out, they upgraded the, the company, saying that the HIV business alone is worth the value of the entire company, around $80 billion. And it sees that its oncology business, by the end of this decade, the roaring 2020s, could be doing $5 billion in sales. And you know, we say $5 billion in sales, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to add $5 billion to the value because it probably trades at four, three or four times sales. So it's looking at adding 15 to 20 billion just on top of that, taking away uh, the HIV business that we have now. And last year, the company did about 27.3 billion in sales. You could add five more on oncology in the next seven years. That's a big addition uh, to that. When you look at uh, potential growth with Gilead right now, revenue is only expected to grow about 1% annually going forward. However, earnings, bottom line, nearly 13% annually in the next couple of years. So we do have some nice uh, uh, potential growth there. Forward price of sales, 3.2. So like I said, that's about normal for a, for a biotech like this. Uh, forward PE ratio is 10, which I think is actually pretty darn cheap. We had a sell-off in January like everything else. But since that time, this stock has held up very well. It bottomed in March. It retested it in June. And since that time, I'm actually going to get a little fancy here and draw a chart. Uh, see if I can draw a line on this chart for you. Look at this. Uh, we got to basically, uh, what I see, an uptrend forming here. I'm not the best artist you'll ever see, but this is a series of higher lows, folks. And I can get even fancier and draw one more and see here, we have a series. I'm a sloppy drawer, I told you. Series of higher highs. We're in an uptrend channel. That's really, really impressive to me because every time we break out, we pull back to a higher level. And if this continues, the next level should be 70. Eh, it's only 10% from here, but still. And Gilead is paying a 4.5% dividend on top of this. So you gain exposure to a company that has some potentially blockbuster oncology drugs coming forward in the next several years. It also pays a 4.5% dividend. It's got a nice looking chart. Uh, it's got nice money coming in already. It's already making uh, good money with a PE ratio right now of 10, which is well below the market. And, you know, earnings again. They're not blockbuster, but expected to grow uh, double, low double digits in the next couple of years. So that's a company, again, you may want to add to the watch list um, going forward. And year to date coming into today, Gilead was down about 8% versus, again, the S&P down, well, mid-20s. Uh, and just we left this aisle before, but at, uh, IBM coming in uh, to today was down 7.7%. Again, easily beating the S&P. 500. And I'll show you a chart of all the performances here once I go through them. The third we're going to take a look at, and this stock has had a hell of a year to be really blunt with you. And this is ExxonMobil. You know, obviously we know Exxon has done well with all the oil and gas companies uh, as oil has done very well this year, going from basically negative prices back during the pandemic up to triple digits. We've pulled back since then, but still Oil and gas stocks, energy have been the best performers, uh, head and shoulders above the rest of the sectors so far this year. ExxonMobil, symbol XOM, has a 3.5% uh, dividend yield. Uh, it is a $412 billion company. It's the world's largest refiner. It has capacity refining 4.6 million barrels of oil per day. That's a huge number. It's also one of the world's largest producers of commodity and specialty chemicals because obviously uh, with fossil fuels, you can make a lot of uh, commodities and, and chemicals from that. Um, you look forward at the numbers, both their earnings and revenue are expected to fall in the coming years, obviously because we've had such a spike up that, that a lot of times uh, if you have that, there's expectation that potentially oil prices will top out or slowly go down, thus directly affecting revenue and uh, bottom line earnings going forward. Could it be more supply coming online? Could it be demand coming down a bit? Could be a combination of both. But even if you look at it, uh, the S&P or the uh, PE ratio, I should say, uh, about 9.2 price of sales is one. So it's still trading at, at a very nice level. 
So let's take a look here at the chart. So one of the better looking charts you're going to see. It's up about 70% or so uh, for the year coming into today. You can see I'm just, just a blockbuster uh, chart, not far from a high. Let me zoom out here a little bit and show you what's going on. Um, you can see it didn't really do much for years and it's taken off. I'm going to zoom out even a little bit further and it's, it's up against its high from 2014. And believe it or not, uh, ExxonMobil this year, is up about 70% or so coming into today. And if you look at the return of the last 10 years of ExxonMobil, it's up about 70%. So that entire gain really has come, I mean, obviously it's been ups and downs, it's been up more down, you know, down a, a lot more. But if you would have bought 10 years ago to today, it's up 70%. If you would have bought beginning of this year to now, it's up 70%. Commodity driven business, you're gonna see returns like that. Uh, but again, 3.5% dividend yield. This is all going to be driven by oil prices. And, you know, the demand for oil is not going anywhere. Uh, all that being said, uh, you want to be careful with ExxonMobil because it is up near the top. And I don't know how much more upside we have going from there. But I wanted to put an oil and gas company out there for you today. So that's number three. Number four uh, is symbol T. And that's AT&T. $106 billion business pays an annual dividend 7.3%. So that's way up there. Uh, it is the uh, um, basically a wireless business these days. And wireless uh, business makes about two thirds of its revenue. It's the uh, third largest wireless business uh, in the country. It's got 68 million postpaid, which means people who pay as the bill comes afterwards, uh, subscribers, 17 million prepaid, so you pay ahead um, uh, subscribers. Uh, the enterprise fixed line, which is, you know, the, running the broadband and that type of stuff, enterprise to businesses, makes about 20% of the uh, revenue. Uh, residential fixed line, which is like if I had AT&T running here, which I don't, I believe I have in Xfinity, 10% uh, of uh, the revenue. So the fixed line makes about 30%. The rest comes from the wireless business. They also own uh, indirectly 70% of DirecTV. They don't put those numbers into here, but they own 70% of DirecTV as well. And just until the last couple of uh, year or two, they were a bit of a media company as well. They finally get the spinoff of Warner Media that was completed in this April. Uh, and so they basically got rid of their last money sucking business. Because when it comes to media and entertainment, you spend so much money to get subscribers, so much money to get new content out there. So the company is struggling. So a new executive come in and say, we got to change this. And they, they got rid of the entertainment business. And it makes sense. Because you can't do both. There's not enough money. They have, they're spending so much right now, capital expenditures, to expand 5G. And eventually it's going to be 6G. You, you're constantly investing new money, new technology for wireless uh, communications, which makes up two-thirds of their business. So they needed to expand that, invest in that, and at the same time trying to invest in the media business wasn't working. So they spun it off. So they spun that off, and uh, the numbers now are looking to turn around. Second quarter of this year, they added more postpaid customers, which is the ones you want. You don't want the prepaid aren't bad, but you want the postpaid ones. More postpaid customers in the second quarter in over a decade for that quarter. And the strength's continuing since then. We're seeing this numbers really uh, be very strong. We're also seeing big demand for fiber. That is going to be the fixed line, which makes up, again, about one third of the business due to work at home as more people need faster connections. I pay extra here for, for, the, for the podcast studio here in my, in my house. And paying mortgage, we need fast internet. And that's, we're seeing a lot of that expand. Uh, looking forward, revenue going to be flat next couple of years. Earnings expected to grow by 4%. So you're not seeing big upside. However, PE ratio 5.9, price of sales 0.86, very uh, undervalued. The big question I have around AT&T is, uh, can it continue to fund this very big dividend, as I mentioned, which is 7.3%? It's free cash flow. Uh, the company warned that it's going to come in about $2 billion less this year, a couple months ago, and below the initial forecast. So when I, when I think about that, it concerns me that they can keep up with the dividend. I think they will personally, uh, but there is a concern, and that's, that's a risk that you have to realize that you have uh, with AT&T. So let's take a look at a chart here. This is one of the uglier looking charts of AT&T, as you can see, breaking down to a new 52-week uh, low here. Well, let me zoom out even more. You can see AT&T is hitting the lowest level. I need to go out even further to see when it's been down this level. My goodness, we've been at this level in AT&T since 2003, and we're testing that right now. So you're looking at a nearly two-decade low. 
as a man who kind of started with fundamentals and technicals, and I love technical analysis, I looked at this and I said, I'm not going to catch the falling knife. Again, I wanted to put it out there for you, though, to show that there are areas out there where there's big income available. Not all charts are going to look great. As a matter of fact here, let me show you this chart right now um, of the stocks I just mentioned and the S&P. This is as of coming into today, as of yesterday. You can see year to date, Exxon up 70%. Uh, we IBM down seven and change. We had Gilead down eight, AT&T down about 14, and then the S&P down 23. As, again, as of yesterday, they're all probably down a little bit more right now, but they're outperforming the market, not as much as ExxonMobil, but outperforming the market. Uh, these are total returns, so it does take in consideration the dividends as well. Uh, so it's something, again, to consider because we talk about so much small cap, mid cap innovation companies. I want you to show that you need to have a diversified portfolio. Portfolios cannot be just one sided with innovation. You must think outside the box and look other places as well. Before we wrap the show real quick, we'll take a look at the S&P 500. Uh, near the highs of the day, we're only down a half a percent right now. I feel like excited to say that. Maybe we're forming a short-term double bottom here. I don't know. One other chart to take a look at, this is the VIX. This measures fear uh, in the market. And you can see we're close to the higher level of more fear to levels that we have really only seen a few times. And if I take a look out here, this is important. Uh, if we were about 33 and change, but if we break above and, and we spike at all, you know, this is the pandemic. That's, that's kind of an outlier. Uh, this is a bit of an outlier here. You take the outliers out. We're nearing a higher, higher level than normal on the VIX. And the old adage says, when the VIX is low, it's time to go. When the VIX is high, it's time to buy. We're not at that high yet. So if we get a spike at some point, this could be another indication, along with the sentiment readings, that the market could hold these bottom. Maybe it is a short-term buying opportunity. All right, folks, once again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're able to give you the three pillars of this show. Number one, we want to educate you, which I think we did through these stocks that we shared today. Uh, two, have fun. I hope you have fun. Number three, make money. And that comes in time. I have no doubt that that comes in time as well. So thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful next few days. We have a great interview with one of my favorite guests coming up on Thursday, Ryan Dietrich. He's a master of charts, the master of stats. He's a master of a lot of things. He's going to come on. We're going to break down the numbers. And he's got all the numbers, folks. We're going to talk about what it means for the market today. And more importantly, going forward. So we got that on Thursday. Do not miss it. And again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm Matt McCall, and that was Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.